Thank you for joining the American Association of Kidney Patients for our session on disease management, advancement in identification and diagnosis of kidney diseases. My name is Erin Kale, AAKP's Director of Patient Insights, Data Analytics and Advocacy for the Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy and the Center for Patient Research and Education. Today, I am pleased to introduce a series of presentations from renowned clinic clinicians, Dr. Barry Friedman, Chief of Nephrology at Wake Forest School of Medicine, who will present on the Apollo Kidney Project, and Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb, Co-Director of the University of Washington Center for Dialysis Innovation and Director of the Kidney Research Institute, who will present on the Kidney Pre Precision Medicine Project. I would also like to give a quick congratulations to Dr. Himmelfarb on being named a winner for the Kidney X Artificial Kidney Prize. Joining Drs. Friedman and Himmelfarb is also a friend and AAKP ally, David Davenport, Manager of Public Policy and Secretary to the Board for the Precision Medicine Coalition. Each presentation will demonstrate the investments being made and those needed to accelerate groundbreaking advances in kidney disease research and innovation, while also making a substantive impact on kidney disease identification and diagnosis and improve patient outcomes, especially among communities of color who are dis disproportionately impacted by this condition. I am pleased to now turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Barry Friedman. I wanna thank uh, Aaron, Richard, and everybody at AAKP for this opportunity. I think uh, everyone knows that uh, the rates of kidney disease are much higher in the African American population than any other population. If you compare it to the white population, the Asian American, the Native American population, African Americans face threefold higher risk of end-stage kidney disease than all of the other groups. In fact, that is nearly fully explained by that single ApoL1 gene differences between racial and ethnic groups. With the patients that we often see with this disease have long been described as having hypertensive kidney failure or just end-stage kidney disease in the chart. For many years, we didn't know the real cause of kidney disease. And here's a middle-aged African-American woman who was thin, not diabetes, did not have diabetes, didn't have much protein in the urine, and was told her kidney failure was from high blood pressure, when in fact, it's an inherited disease from the ApoL1 gene. So this paper was published in the journal Science in 2010. We're celebrating its 10th year discovery of the ApoL1 gene. The ApoL1 gene is the single most powerful gene associated with a common human disease ever found. It just happens to be a kidney disease. And if you look at that picture, you see the blue parasites swimming in the bloodstream surrounded by the red blood cells of a patient who's infected with African sleeping sickness. And it turns out that the changes in the ApoL1 gene, which initially were found only in sub-Saharan Africa, could kill certain of these parasites. Yet, although they protected people from these forms of African sleeping sickness, which led them to live longer and get transmitted to, um, to next generations, one thing that was not known until 2010 was that these protective variants from the parasitic disease caused kidney disease. And people who get one copy of the risk gene from their mother and one from their father, so two copies of the risk gene, are at very high risk for getting kidney disease. And those risk variants are virtually limited to the African-American population. So we now know that the reason many different kidney diseases have clustered in tightly in many black families. So for those of you in AAKP who have multiple relatives on dialysis, some of whom may have thought they had high blood pressure induced kidney failure, others with glomerular diseases like FSGS, others with HIV associated nephropathy or COVID-19 associated nephropathy, lupus causing kidney disease or sickle cell disease, we now know that those two changes in the ApoL1 gene one from your mother, one from your father, puts you at risk for all of these different diseases. All are non-diabetes associated forms of kidney disease. All are much more common in the African-American community. So to put this gene in perspective, 13% of all African-Americans have two copies of the risk variants, which put them at high risk for kidney disease. 
That's more than 5 million African Americans. And those individuals probably have a 15 or 20% chance of getting kidney disease. However, most of them, 80 to 85% will not get kidney disease. Another 39% of all African Americans have one copy of the APOL1 risk variant, which means they're carriers and can transmit that one copy of the risk variant to half of their children. So, you know, if, if two people with one variant have a child, there's a 25% that child will get two risk variants and be at risk for kidney disease. But these variants are not present in whites, Asians, Hispanics, and they explain why African Americans are at such higher risk of kidney disease. Matter of fact, 70% of all cases of FSGS and HIV nephropathy in the African American population would never occur if it weren't for these variants in the APOL1 gene. That's how powerful they are. And we now know that more than one of every three African Americans on dialysis, so if you're from Los Angeles, Birmingham, Alabama, Chicago, New York, or North Carolina, and you walk into a dialysis unit, one of every three African Americans on dialysis has kidney failure from this gene. And it explains much of that excess risk for kidney disease. It explains why African Americans have more and more severe kidney disease when they get lupus compared to other groups. And it also explains why kidneys donated from African Americans fail more quickly after transplantation. And I'm going to show you that data. It's been known for a long time that if someone receives a kidney from an African American deceased donor, the kidneys after transplant don't function for as long as kidneys donated by any other ethnic group. It doesn't matter the race of the recipient of the kidney, it's the donor race. And nobody knew why for years and years. APOL1 changed in our understanding. This is a study that we did at Wake Forest very early on, one year after discovery of the gene relationship with kidney disease. And I want you to see there's two groups there. Those are all African-American deceased donor kidney transplants. They're all black. That the group on top in blue, APOL1 non-risk, had zero or one copies of the risk variants, and their transplants did extremely well over seven years. But the African-American group in red at the bottom had two copies of the risk variants in the donated kidney. And look how quickly they failed. This explains the fact that it is not the race of the donor. It's their APOL1 genotype because all these donors were black. This study met with tremendous uh, pushback because it was done at Wake Forest, a single center study and a small number of donors. So we then reached out to other transplant programs and we studied more than 1,150 deceased donor kidney transplants whose kidneys came from 624 different African-American deceased donors. These were done at 113 different kidney transplant centers. And you can see at six years, the group that transplants from donors with two risk variants in APOL1 were twice as likely to fail as kidneys donated by African-Americans with less than two copies. The APOL1 genotype of the donor is determining the outcomes after the transplant, not the race of the donor. This is critically important because the way kidneys are given out for transplantation is there's a risk score to know how risky that donor kidney is to match recipients who are healthy with the best quality kidneys or recipients who are maybe not as healthy with lower quality kidneys. So the kidneys last as long as that recipient needs. And there are 10 factors that are calculated to determine what is the risk. One of the 10 is if you're African-American or not. Well, that is totally inappropriate. When we know the actual gene causing the change, we shouldn't use a social construct such as race. So we went back and we did the study in the 1,153 deceased donor kidney transplants, replacing the risk based on African-American race with the genotypes which we knew. I'm just gonna end here by showing that in the current allocation, the way deceased donor kidneys are given out, this is those 1,153 transplants I just showed you. They have about a 70% risk factor, which means those kidneys were estimated to function worse than more than 70% of all the kidney transplants done in the prior year. You can see if you have zero or one risk variant, it's 71% or two risk variant, 69. They're all about the same, 70% risk, but that's assuming the donor was black. If we take that out, and we insert APOL1 genotype, look at the change. The 71% falls to 53%. That means those kidneys are average. They're perfectly good. They're not high risk. They function you know, worse than about half of all kidneys transplanted. They're average. But if the donor had two risk variants, 
they're much worse than 70%. They're actually worse than nearly 90% of all kidney transplants. Well, why is that important? Because 87% of the time, those kidneys are much better than currently estimated. It's only 13% of the time that they're high-risk kidneys that are gonna fail more quickly. So we can improve the quality score in 87% of donated kidneys, and we think that'll make them less likely to get discarded. They're perfectly good for transplant, and they'll help many people. And my last slide shows, as we've talked about with Lori's story, African-American donors of kidneys are at higher risk for getting kidney disease than any other racial or ethnic group. And it was unclear why black donors had more kidney disease after donating. And this is a study from Mona Doshi that works with Lori that showed, and, and Marielle Goggins is a co-author on this study, that showed that after people, African-Americans donated and their genotypes were looked at, at long-term follow-up, there was higher risk of kidney disease and more severe kidney disease in the donors who had two copies of ApoL1 than in the low-risk group. So in fact, ApoL1 explains a tremendous amount of kidney disease in the black community and appears to play a very important role in outcomes after transplantation. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. I would now like to welcome Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb. My name is Jonathan Himmelfarb. I'm a nephrologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Washington. And I'd like to thank the AAKP for the opportunity today to discuss with you the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, which is a very exciting NIH funded project looking for breakthroughs in kidney health. And I'm hopeful that we can find a breakthrough in kidney health together. Well, what is the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, or KPMP? It's a multi-year collaboration of many leading research institutions around the United States who have convened together to study patients with important kidney diseases that often lead to kidney failure. And our goal is to understand the mechanisms of the two most dominant conditions that affect the public health related to kidney function in the United States. These are acute kidney injury, or AKI, and chronic kidney disease, or CKD. The goals of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project ultimately are to identify new treatments and better treatments for the most common types of kidney diseases that will have the most impact on the most people living with kidney disease. In order to accomplish that goal, our plan is to ethically collect kidney biopsies from participants in the study who have these conditions, either acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. And with those kidney biopsies, we will create what's called a kidney tissue atlas in health and in disease to better define what's going on in the kidney uh, that can help us identify these new treatments. And by doing this, we also hope to identify new subgroups, meaning of all the people with chronic kidney disease, for example, or acute kidney injury, can we classify each of these individuals in a way that will give a better understanding of what's really causing the disease for that individual person. That's really the goal of precision medicine. And critical to the success of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project from the get-go, we have recognized the need for patient engagement in every activity. Patients really are at the core of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, and patients sit on all of our important committees and working groups and are very active in defining how this whole consortium works. Now, how do patients fit into this structure of this complex uh, research project, the KPMP? The primary mechanism is through what we call the Community Engagement Committee, or CEC. And this committee is central to almost everything that happens inside the KPMP. The membership of this committee consists of patients, scientists, and clinicians together. And together they deliberate on all the important issues in KPMP and they advise every aspect of the consortium and of the work that gets done. They advise the leadership. They, again, are connected to all of our different committee activities. Many of the committees, when they're grappling with an ethical issue or a problematic issue, will say, well, let's see what the community engagement committee thinks about that. So this has become 
perhaps the most influential committee in all of the kidney precision medicine project. And since the goal of KPMP is to conduct cutting edge research in an effort to help patients, we want to design the study to answer the questions that patients have for us. And patients wanna know, what do I have? What will happen to me? What can I do about it? And what does it mean for my family in many cases, as many kidney diseases have a familial or a genetic component. And most patients prefer what we call a precision medicine approach. And that means for a given individual person with kidney disease, what's the right intervention or the right treatment, in other words, for the right patient at the right time, rather than one size fits all, where we would treat whole groups of patients the same and some would benefit from that treatment and some might not, what's the best possible intervention or treatment for me with my condition? That's what patients really want to know. And that's the essence of what we call precision medicine. Now, why would an individual with kidney disease want to participate in KPNP? Recognizing that this is a research project, it involves undergoing a kidney biopsy, so it involves taking some personal risk, where the goal is to provide information for the greater good. So this study really involves altruism. It involves people trying to help others and not necessarily getting personal benefit from participating in this study. In order for this study to be ethical, it's important that there be a rationale that makes sense for why somebody would want to participate in the study. And the rationale really has to do with what an important public health problem kidney disease is. We know it's now the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, that many millions of people, both in the United States and globally, have chronic kidney disease or develop acute kidney injury. And furthermore, most of the people who end up on dialysis or getting a kidney transplant, their disease was attributed to hypertension or diabetes. They're disproportionately African-American. African-Americans are roughly 12% of the US population and at least 33% of the population of people that end up on dialysis. So it's one of the greatest healthcare disparities that we have in our society. Many people of recent West African descent carry genetic risks uh, that may account for that excess risk of kidney disease. And we want to be able to understand that to mitigate that risk and improve the health care for African Americans. For so many people that have kidney disease that's attributed to diabetes or attributed to high blood pressure, the standard of care does not include a kidney biopsy. So many people go through life knowing they have kidney disease, the kidney disease is getting worse and their physicians did not recommend a kidney biopsy. So we don't really understand at the tissue level inside the kidney, what's really going on, what are the mechanisms that are causing the disease process. We do know with acute kidney injury that these episodes that are increasingly frequent, especially among people in the hospital, that this can be very morbid and even mortal cause mortality. And also we've learned that episodes of acute kidney injury, even when it seems like somebody has recovered well, can contribute very substantially to the subsequent development of chronic kidney disease, or for those people who already had chronic dis kidney disease, it can cause that disease to progress much faster. Unfortunately, there have been very few new effective therapies that have been developed for both chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury in the absence of understanding inside the kidney at a tissue level. And that's the problem we're trying to address with the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. So to improve the public health, we really do need these research level biopsies for these very common diseases that afflict so many people. Now, there is risk to undergoing a kidney biopsy. And so our patients have concerns and we, from the get-go of even thinking about this project, the National Institutes of Health convened panels of patients with kidney disease as well as ethicists to evaluate whether this study was an ethical study. 
And after a lot of consideration, the patient participants in the early phases and also now on our community engagement committee and the ethicists have all concluded this study is a highly ethical study. Even though there's limited benefit to the individuals who are going to undergo a biopsy and participate in the research, there's a very large benefit to society. That is only ethically okay if the information that we're going to obtain is greatly exceeds the potential risks. And that means that we have to absolutely minimize the risks in every possible way for participants in this study. And we really have to honor and value every single person who participates in this study. As one of our patients on the Community Engagement Committee recently stated, the patient participants are the heroes of this study. So that's critically important for this study uh, to be an ethical study, and that is embedded uh, philosophically in everything that we do. We want to uh, enhance safety, minimize discomfort, and minimize or eliminate any costs to individuals from participating in this study. Now, the issue of cost came up and was brought up by our patients on our community engagement committee, uh, that if you are altruistically asked to participate in a study and you agree to participate in a study and you undergo a kidney biopsy that may or may not have been medically advisable and may not be medically necessary, as a quote from one of our uh, patients was, it sounds unconscionable to put all the financial here, altruistic kidney tissue donor. So we took that to heart, and perhaps as a first-in-its-kind study, we have obtained a no-fault ident identification insurance to ensure that participants won't be penalized by participating in this study. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we want to do absolutely everything we possibly can to ensure participant safety in the kidney precision medicine project. That's especially centered around the kidney biopsy. And so we've gone to great lengths to create criteria and protocols in this study that'll maximize safety, minimize the chances for any harm, both prior to the kidney biopsy, during the kidney biopsy, and after the kidney biopsy. This includes creating biopsy checklists that are looked at immediately prior to the biopsy by having a safety adjudication committee and a data safety monitoring committee that looks at any complications that take place. And most importantly, by creating a culture for problems and addressing those problems sooner rather than later, ideally preemptively before any harm takes place. And I say with certainty that we're doing everything we can to ensure participant safety. And to date, participants have done very well in this study. And we also go through a process after the biopsy of surveying our participants to ensure their satisfaction with participating in the study. We value our participants uh, very much. They really truly are the heroes of KPMP. So with all the precautions that we're taking uh, and uh, for this study, how do we expect to change the world for people living with acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease? Well, with biopsy tissue, this is a picture of how the work proceeds in this study really after the biopsy has taken place. In what's called the clinical presentation, which is all the information from surveys and questions and laboratory tests and looking at the electronic medical record. We amalgamate that data for each participant. We look at the pathology, the tissue, the kidney tissue under the microscope, and we use some very fancy digital techniques to really understand the biopsy tissue. And then we use really truly state-of-the-art technologies to interrogate that biopsy tissue on a cellular basis to understand what's happening with every single cell inside that kidney biopsy that's either causing the disease process or perhaps accelerating repair. And then we will track clinical outcomes in the long term and we'll use all these data sets together, tremendous amount of data, 
And that's part of why we value every participant in this study to create the kidney atlas that we talked about, develop these mechanism-based disease subtypes, to identify the critical cells, pathways, and targets so that people can develop better and safer treatments for the variety of kidney diseases. The consortium is a large consortium. We now have over 40 different major academic medical centers and literally hundreds of investigators uh, working in this study collaboratively together and all for the same common goal, which is to really understand and create new, better, safer, more effective treatments for the common types of kidney disease, acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. So we have a plan. We have many investigators at the leading medical centers throughout the United States working on this project. How does this project actually happen? What happens after a kidney biopsy has taken place? Well, in the middle panel here, you can see a typical kidney biopsy, which has the elements of the kidney, the tubules. You also see a lot of scarring in this particular biopsy, which is in the blue color uh, that you see right here. And then to the left-hand uh, panel, you see how we can take every single cell in this biopsy and analyze what type of cell it is and what genes are being activated or what proteins are being activated in that cell. And then we can spatially localize that to where is this is happening in that kidney biopsy. Is it in a period where a uh, part of the biopsy where there's scarring? Is it in a healthier part of the kidney? Is it part of a injury process or a reparative process? And then we can look at even more detail as you see in the panel uh, on the right using something called electron microscopy where we can not only look at cells, but each of the individual components inside a cell. So we have phenomenal technologies now to deploy and apply to interrogate these kidney biopsies uh, to establish and accomplish the goals of the KPMP. And I'll show an example from one of our tissue interrogation sites here, which is from WashU St. Louis and UC San Diego. They're using a technology called single nucleus RNA sequencing or uh, SNRNA-seq. And these are remarkable technologies that have been developed in the last decade where you can take, as you see on the left-hand side here, the kidney tissue. This is a kidney here. You take the tissue and you break it down into the, uh, the nucleus that, that, that contains the DNA from every single cell in the biopsy, and then we process this through uh, these uh, new assay technologies that have been developed, and we use these very fancy bioinformatic approaches to identify every single cell type in the kidney. And as mentioned before, we can then look at what genes are being expressed uh, uh, and upregulated or downregulated in each of these uh, individual cells inside this kidney biopsy. And this is but one technique that we're using inside the Kidney Precision Medicine Project to interrogate these valuable research quality kidney biopsy tissue sections. Now, it's relatively early uh, going in this study. This is intended to be a long-term study, but already we're seeing suggestions that this study is going to be a game changer. One thing that we're seeing is that in many of these biopsies that wouldn't have taken place necessarily for clinical purposes, even though we separate out clinically acute kidney injury from chronic kidney disease, when we look at the pathology at, at the tissue under the microscope, and we, when we look at these single cell techniques and other molecular techniques to see what's going on in the kidney, there's some convergence. So although these are uh, clinically considered separate syndromes, the same drivers of injury or the same drivers of repair we, we are tending to see, which suggests that there may be some therapies for one that would be beneficial for the other condition. We're also seeing that when seasoned clinicians look at these uh, cases and all the clinical data and think they know what's going on, and then they see the biopsy that might not have been done for clinical purposes, in many cases, the pathology diagnosis is different than what people thought before the biopsy. And in some cases, although 
again, participants are participating because they are altruistic and they're not expecting to have personal benefit for, from participating in this study. We're already seeing in some cases that the biopsy review is changing management uh, for some individuals who are participants. So these are early signs, they're not definitive, but it makes us hopeful that this research project is going to be a game changer in the long run. One of the important principles for the Kidney Precision Medicine Project is we want to make this data available as a community resource for the entire research community. And in fact, beyond the research community, ultimately for patients and for clinicians as well. And so as soon as the data is validated and quality controlled and curated, we're putting that data into a data repository and making it available on the Kidney Precision Medicine Project database on, their, on our website. And already there's more than 1,500 data set files, which many researchers are downloading to advance the cause of coming up with new treatments for these particular types of kidney diseases. And our thinking about this study is this data should be a community resource for many types of external stakeholders. So we also wanna to create tools, online tools, that we will put on the website that will make it easier for a variety of different kind of users to use this data. That includes patients as participants. Ultimately, we hope patients, even if they're not participants in KPMP, can learn from these data sets. Pathologists who normally look at kidney tissue under the microscope, clinicians who take care of patients, and then various kinds of researchers. So we anticipate creating the tools that will allow each of these kinds of stakeholders to obtain value from this community resource. This slide shows how you can access on our website, the data repository, if you wanna download a data. We have de-identified the data that's publicly available, which means it can't be used to identify the participants. Uh, but the data can be used to understand and to treat kidney disease, hopefully in the future. The goal of KPMP is to be inclusive and collaborative from the outset. And so we've created many different vehicles or mechanisms by which the data can be used by this large community. And we reach out as well to other research uh, projects so that the data can be shared between them. It's our common goal come up with better treatments, safer, more effective treatments for these common kidney diseases. I wanna emphasize in closing that this project, the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, really is unique in the world of precision, in part because we have engaged the entire community, patients, clinicians, scientists, and ethicists from the get-go, from the outset, and in every aspect of what we do. And in this study, patients really are equitable partners who have an active voice in the entire research enterprise. The culture promotes priorities and safety of patients first, and we are addressing big public health problems that really most commonly lead to end-stage kidney disease or kidney failure. So if we can make an impact on these diseases, it will have a large impact on the most people uh, that we could impact from a public health perspective. The ATLAS has a clinical orientation, so uh, it will teach us about the kidney and how it functions in health, as well as the kidney and how it functions in disease conditions. And we are creating next generation tools, including next generation digital kidney pathology, using very deep biological profiling with the tissue interrogation site omics technologies, and also using machine learning and artificial intelligence to better understand injury and repair uh, with these kidney diseases. So once again, I'd like to thank the AAKP for the opportunity to talk to you today about this very exciting research uh, project that's in uh, the early phases, but shows tremendous uh, promise for the future. And our goal is really, truly, uh, impact the lives in a positive way of people living with these common kidney diseases. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Himmelfarb. And now for our final session presentation, I turn it over to David Davenport. Hi, everyone. My name is David Davenport from the Personalized Medicine Coalition. I'm the manager of Puck Policy and secretary to the board at the organization. And I really appreciate AKP for inviting us. PMC is a coalition of over 200 organizations spanning the healthcare spectrum to advocate for personalized medicine. This includes patient advocacy organizations such as AAKP, who represent uh, cancers, rare diseases, and health disparities, research and clinical care institutions, both in the community and the academic setting, pharmaceutical and diagnostic companies, a payer, IT informatics companies, venture capitalists, and a number of other strategic partners. With my presentation today, I'd like to provide some background on personalized medicine share some activities that PMC is leading to advance personalized medicine for patients, and highlight some uh, key opportunities along these lines for uh, improving uh, the delivery of personalized medicine. So uh, just as a little bit of background, um, PMC defines personalized medicine as an evolving field in which physicians use diagnostic tests to determine which medical treatments will work best for each patient. By combining the data from those tests with an individual's medical history, circumstances, and values, healthcare providers can develop targeted treatment and prevention plans. Personalized medicine can benefit patients by shifting the emphasis in medicine from reaction to prevention, reducing trial and error prescribing, reducing adverse drug reactions, revealing additional uses for medicines, increasing patient adherence to treatment, reducing high-risk invasive testing procedures, and finally, helping to control the overall cost of healthcare. In the case of kidney disease, a test many of you are probably familiar with is Allomap. Allomap is a multi-gene expression test that detects whether the immune system of a transplant recipient is rejecting the new kidney. Allomap was one of the first examples outside of oncology where a biomarker test informed transplant uh, care. Over the past few years, these tests have grown in their complexity to measure the likelihood of organ rejection. As research in kidney disease, such as through the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, look at biological and genetic markers that may be underpinning the onset of kidney disease, personalized medicine presents opportunities to develop treatments targeting those biological pathways. Thanks in part to an intentionally supportive regulatory environment in the United States, personalized medicine is a rapidly evolving field. For each of the past five years, personalized medicines have accounted for a quarter or more of new drugs approved by FDA, with a record of 42% in 2018. In 2005, personalized medicines accounted for only 5% of new drug approvals. The most recent approvals address the root causes of rare diseases and many patients for whom there were no options before, including those diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, and sickle cell disease. And what we've also seen over the past decade is a growing number of personalized medicines being available to patients outside of oncology. Personalized medicine presents opportunities to understand how differences in an individual's biology affect his or her health so that prevention strategies and treatments are guided to those who will benefit. However, there are fundamental gaps in awareness and access that impact the speed at which personalized medicine products and services are integrated into healthcare. The healthcare system has made incremental progress in advancing personalized medicine, but we must continue to do so in order for the health system to fully consider the individuality of patients' health needs. This uptick in personalized medicines coming to market has challenged the healthcare system in terms of how new treatments are regulated, covered, and reimbursed by health insurance, as well as integrated into the clinical setting. PMC is working on all of these fronts to make sure that the health system moves from a one-size-fits-all approach to one that considers a patient's individual variability. And in particular, for the rest of my presentation, I'd like to focus on uh, one of PMC's initiatives to better understand patients' priorities for improving their health care when it comes to personalized medicine. A little over two years ago, PMC received a two-year engagement award from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute to convene uh, patients um, as well as healthcare providers and other key stakeholders to develop a research agenda that looks at um, patients' priorities for improving the delivery of personalized medicine and how to change healthcare in a way that is most meaningful to them. 
some of the lessons that we had from our discussions over the past year, years with patients uh, include that healthcare professionals must listen to their patients and have more nuanced conversations. Uh, but they're also um, facing their own barriers as well when it comes to having adequate uh, resources and technologies to interpret and um, uh, provide treatment options that are based on a patient's genetic information. Patients uh, indicated that considering uh, their values and circumstances in the treatment decision-making process was just as important as considering their biology. They want, patient, they want family and caregiver considerations, financial concerns, as well as reservations about participating in clinical research to be a part of that conversation as well. Uh, patients um, want to be educated uh, over a period of time and not just at diagnosis. And given the diagnosis shock that many patients experience uh, when they learn um, that they uh, now have a disease or condition, many patients express preferences for being educated about uh, the benefits of personalized medicine prior to their diagnosis. Um, when it comes to access and affordability considerations, one of uh, the questions that could use further research is how do a patient's needs and access barriers, including those related to cost and affordability, change depending on the purpose of the genetic test? For example, a test to identify a patient's risk of developing a disease uh, versus um, a test to identify an appropriate treatment option for that patient. Uh, the patients who participated in these discussions uh, really spanned um, an array of disease areas uh, and backgrounds, as well as health needs. Um, and uh, one of the uh, concerns that was uh, brought to us by um, many of the, uh, our minority patients participating in the project was the historical mistrust of medical research in particular patient populations. And in order to advance personalized medicine, uh, clinical trials not must not only um, increase uh, diversity, but really focus on um, building trust with uh, patient participants. Another way through doing this is um, by increasing uh, transparency for patients when it comes to uh, the information that is being collected from them and how that is being used. Um, finally, um, we also did talk about um, changes that need to help happen um, to the healthcare system um, writ large in order to improve personalized medicine delivery. And when it comes to um, updating uh, billing and reimbursement structures, uh, both patients and providers indicated that changes are needed in order to um, facilitate them educating patients about person treatment options, especially if multiple uh, uh, sessions are required to discuss options and educate them. So overall, to improve patient outcomes with personalized medicine, the healthcare community must shift away from a one-size-fits-all paradigm to a system centered around a patient's unique needs and priorities. The health system, including billing and reimbursement structures and data systems, must improve to create opportunities for continued patient education about genomics and personalized treatment options in varying healthcare settings. Professionals and researchers must also focus on being transparent and building trust to address biases and inequities facing minority populations. And we'll be coming out with um, a white paper later this summer that outlines uh, the research agenda as well as the project. Um, and we look forward to sharing that with you. Um, uh, thank you to AKP for, again, for inviting us to participate. Thank you, David. And thank you again, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Himmelfarb for the informative presentations today. And thank you all for joining us.